so for the next keynote session, we have one of the most visible and respected thought leaders in the global channel named to the top 40 under 40 by the business review as well as is often sought out for industry guidance and future trends ladies and gentlemen please welcome jay mcben the principal analyst for global channels partnerships and alliances at foresto he'll be sharing his holistic view of the channel trends in 2021 it's a pleasure to have you here jay over to you well, thank you so much for, for having me and uh, really uh, excited uh, about this event as, as, as well as uh, talking about this session. Uh, so jumping right in, um, you know, I get to wake up every morning thinking about the broader channel, not only in Canada, but I get to think about it around the world. Uh, I get to think about channels, not only in the technology industry, but I get to think about channels uh, actually um, in every industry where 75% of everything we do in our consumer and our professional lives go through others. The last time we bought a car was from a dealer. The last time we bought a TV was from a retailer. The last time we bought a jar of peanut butter was from a grocer. Well, in the technology industry, it's about a three and a half trillion dollar industry. Almost 64% of it goes through the channel, almost two thirds. And then in Canada, it's about 61% of the $93 billion uh, market. So. Very, uh, very large, very uh, exciting market, very vibrant market, and a lot of changes. And just in the last year, I'll share many of the different trends, but we've been seeing changes over a number of years. And so I worked in Canada as a channel leader for companies like IBM and Lenovo. You know, we would count in Canada about 15,000 or so VARs. Uh, there was a, obviously an emergence of uh, hundreds and then thousands of managed service providers and managed security. And we always looked at the middle of this in terms of how we defined the channel, which was really a transacting channel in Canada. There was bolt-on system integrators and ISVs and others that you know, had different business models. But since then, every company in every industry has becoming a tech company. And every service company in every industry is following suit. So if I look in Canada, you know, 81% of the accountants, the CPAs, the CGAs, the CAs, 81% of them are becoming tech partners as they're out implementing and integrating, you know, products like Dynamics and NetSuite and Sage and Intuit, et cetera. I look at marketing of the, you know, thousands of digital agencies in Canada, there are 78% of them are now doing tech services. There are many companies in Canada where the head of marketing spends more money on technology than the head of IT. And the digital agency is taking on a lot of the 8,000 software companies that are in the MarTech stack today and making it all make sense in the market. So it's exciting to watch on the right, what I used to call shadow channels come in, on the left, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, emerging tech, you know, we're watching 800,000 companies in Internet of Things, AI, automation, blockchain, and other technologies like quantum computing. There are 175,000 software companies today, up from 10,000 10 years ago. And I believe this number will be a million 10 years from now. And I'll explain why I think that. So the question is why? Why would every company in every industry become a tech company, number one? you know, the levels of disruption they're facing. But what's the opportunity for every service company in the world to jump into technology? And it's really a story of vectors. And we know for decades, we've always thought of the Canadian market in verticals. There's obviously a very strong government in Canada. There's strong, you know, five strong banks. We, we look at the verticals in Canada, but really we're looking now at the vectors. And when I said that the head of marketing spends more money on technology than the head of IT, that's important. We know today in cloud, for example, in the SaaS market, 65% of decisions happen outside of IT. So the head of marketing, the head of sales, the head of operations, the head of finance, the head of HR are leading in two thirds of the cases making decisions. So we have to think about it as different buyers. Number two, it's not about the industries anymore. It's about sub industries. It's not looking at healthcare, but looking at a 50 doctor clinic in Saskatoon. It's looking at a dentist office in Lethbridge. It's looking at uh, 
you know, small hospital in Halifax. There are different markets and obviously different sizes underneath the overall healthcare market that are very different. And I made the geographic changes on purpose because healthcare happens to be a provincially run or state run if you're in the United States or very much a regionally run system. So selling in Lethbridge to Saskatoon to Halifax changes significantly and there's different partners that specialize geographically. Sector size and segment. You know, a 50 doctor clinic runs different than a dentist office, runs different than a small hospital. Their skills, their resources, their ability to execute is different and the partners that support them are different. And then finally, we've got a world where, you know, when I worked at IBM, it was hardware, software and services into the Canadian market. Well, today there's 26 layers of products and you can't have, for example, a security conversation without talking about the seven layers of security and then the 17 layers below that. So there's over 200 subcategories of products. You start multiplying these big numbers around and in Canada, I mean, you're, there's millions of permutations and there are millions of companies. It, it's just a really interesting way to look at the channel and where the opportunity is and why everybody's coming in. But let's take a step back now. We're one year into a pandemic. We're just days away from a year into the pandemic and we get to talk to 690,000 buyers per year. So we ask them a lot of questions, but we're really interested in where's the opportunity now for the channel. We knew that a year ago that we depleted the supply chain in Canada of all laptops. We got everybody a Zoom account. I mean, we built this remote topology very, very quickly and uh, you know, got everybody home, got everybody safe. And you know, it was absolutely, uh, a wonderful experience, you know, for the channel in terms of the recognition of being that essential worker uh, to, to, to help in this pandemic. Well, now a year later, people are asking different questions. It's become about automation is the number one spending area. We're watching industries like RPA grow in some cases by triple digits. We're watching business process automation. RPA, by the way, is robotic process automation. We're watching no code, low code environments in SaaS, but the pandemic was a human based failure. And we're seeing companies quickly jump on and solve for these workflows, the logic, the business processes that were broken when everyone went remote and office space is depleted. So this automation now is touching every part of every organization and has become ground zero for transformation. Number two, we've been seeing unbelievable numbers on the side of multi-cloud and, and somewhat hybrid cloud environments. You know, if you've been watching the financial results last week, Microsoft reported 50% growth of Azure. That's after the previous quarter of 48, the previous quarter of 47. Three financial quarters into COVID, still at 50% growth year over year. Google Cloud was at 54. The head of AWS got a big promotion last week. I mean, it's off the charts growth in terms of companies investing in cloud infrastructure. And from a partnership perspective, we're trying to drag the multiplier, which I'll talk about in a little while. You know, third is this remote topology. We also know that it's not temporary. We're predicting now that somewhere between 20 to 30% of all workers have a different future of work. It won't be as cubicle based as it was in the past. And we're seeing companies now adopt and change their real estate, change their thinking about how work is done. And they're starting to ask better questions now. Now that you know all these consumer notebooks are out there and sitting on consumer networks, going through consumer routers that my employees share with their neighbors, how do we secure all of this? There's brand new threat vectors inside this pandemic. You know, when a cat is sleeping on your keyboard and when your kid is getting homeschooled, your mind might not be on malware or phishing or all these different vectors have changed. And they're asking the risk. They're asking about compliance. They're asking about governance. They're starting to ask more questions about managed services than they ever did in the past. So where managed services about five years ago plateaued a little bit, dropped into single digit growth, we're back strong into double digit growth again, where this environment of a remote or residential network has gone beyond the average company's ability to manage at that level. Nobody's rolling trucks into residential neighborhoods 
And the channel is actually on the forefront of all these different pieces. And then finally, this was a K-shaped recovery. And again, the first time we really saw this where companies that are in hospitality or retail or restaurants or travel severely impacted and continue to be severely impacted all through 2021. Where on the other side of the K recovery, many companies got out of survival mode into thrive mode within months and started asking questions in the second half of last year and now spending money significantly in the areas like customer and partner and employee experience, rethinking curbside service in every one of their industries, governments and healthcare and education. Everyone is rethinking tech and the service of tech and obviously the the delivery in front of customers. Everyone is rethinking e-commerce and marketplaces, which I'm going to go into very specifically. But these are the investment areas that are, again, up by double digits and in some cases, triple digits and where channels are being very successful in terms of driving customer transformations in this environment. So there you've got the four fastest growing areas in Canada, automation, cloud acceleration, remote topology, and this customer experience and investing in people. So let's take a step back, look at some of the big trends that are hitting us in this industry, and then weave them together because almost all of them have been accelerated and amplified because of the pandemic. And so now what might have been on your back burner a year ago is now been forced onto the front burner that we got to start making moves and actions, or there's a threat in the short term now that will be left behind. And one thing we've been watching for a long time is the changing buyer. And everything starts at the customer, and we know that. But we know that in four to five years, the majority of Canadian buyers will be millennials. We know that Generation Z are just getting out of university and getting their first jobs now in Canada. Their preferences, their psychology, their behaviors are different. But everyone's different in terms of their digital and digital-only journeys that they want to carry out and how to serve these digital journeys. We've got a majority of customers getting to vendor selection now without ever talking to a salesperson or filling out a marketing form on the web with the correct information. It's a big change for buyers. So you've got this majority out there that are in these digital journeys, want to get to vendor selection without talking to anybody. Well, now you're losing deals without ever knowing there was a deal. So it's changing the channel uh, in total and it's changing how we go to market and what our routes to market are. So we're seeing an explosion, for example, in PLG, product-led growth. So if you happen to use Zoom, which I think is everyone, um, you know, you'll recognize that at 40 minutes, it's going to hang up on your customer unless you type in your credit card number. If you use Slack, you know, one of the benefits is looking at history. Before it cuts off your history with someone, you're going to write down your credit card number. On Dropbox, you're going to increase your file size or increase your storage limit. All these different product-led growth companies drive it out of the product from a free freemium model into all their sales and marketing is wrapped around the product. Well, you now have 175,000 software companies. The majority of them think that it's a product-led growth world. And as people in the channel, we have to work adjacently to that and make sure that the product, that the, the partners and the ecosystem can run adjacently to that to make all that work. We also, the future buyer work that we do, this looking at the future in terms of the way people buy. You know, we know that consume, the buyers, business buyers are going to look a lot like consumers. The way you buy a software in the future will look more like the way you buy a car today in these digital journeys and where the dealership experience is kind of, you know, bad in both cases. So direct to consumer is starting to make a play in the business where a lot of what we buy in our professional lives is consumption based. And there's no reason to go through a traditional RFP, to go through traditional procurement, to go through the, you know, the effort necessary when it's a consumable. So it's not a dollar shave club razor. It's not, you know, a mattress. But this idea of how much of your life is consumption based and just set it and forget it is starting to creep into B2B. And then this explosion of marketplaces, which, again, I have a special section on because talking about something that is bigger than life grew more in three months at the start of the pandemic than the last 10 years combined. 
And every company in Canada needs a marketplace strategy going forward. The second thing, if we go back to that buyer, they are surrounding themselves during that digital journey with people. It's just in a different format. You know, they'll go and read an ebook, a white paper. They'll listen to a podcast. They'll go and join an association. They'll come to an event like this. They'll do all the things necessary to get smart. Well, the people behind all of that, for example, in Canada, is the law of a few. It's not millions and millions of people doing millions of things. It actually comes down to a handful of people that surround that customer early in their journey. And from a technology perspective, it starts to look like this. The fact is, is in the middle of this, there's 35 million customers. So, I mean, there's a lot. There's potentials for all kinds of scenarios in this chaos theory. But the fact of the matter is, on average, they're going to bring in five people slash companies to help them through those early stages of the journey up until vendor selection. And those early stage companies ought to be partners of yours in the ecosystem because you might not have thought enough about them because the high likelihood that they're non-transacting partners. They'll never collect the customer's money, but they're highly influential in terms of them making vendor selection in your favor. So if we drag it down, there is a group of people in Saskatoon, in Lethbridge and in Halifax that are most likely to drive that mid-size clinic. It's people in the industry, it's consultants, there's medical practitioners, there's a chamber of commerce. I mean, there's a lot of things that surround it. There's local industry publications, there's industry events, there's podcasts. So all the things, but it comes down to a law of a few people. And as many of those people surrounding that customer know about you, know enough of, to be dangerous about you, the 30 second elevator pitch, and then endorse you in front of that customer early and often, not only one-to-one, -one, but on their podcast, on their platform, when they do keynotes, when they write an ebook, all that works in your favor. And it's a different kind of channel than you would have ever built. So we call that, or I call it a tr trifurcated channel, which is a complicated way to say a build, sell and service type of channel. So in that early stage, I spent a lot of time talking about up to the point of vendor selection. You'll see business models here that look like consumer models. You know, this could be mistaken for a Kim Kardashian slide, but it's not. The fact is, is these are non-transacting, non-traditional partners that are highly influential in a world where your customer is going to make vendor selection without ever talking to you. It's critical that you have a early stage influence channel strategy. We have to have a transactional strategy, regardless of where the customer spends their money. Could be through a marketplace, could be through a retail, reseller, agent, dealer, it doesn't matter. It could be direct, but there has to be a transactional strategy that serves your customer in the place that they want to spend the money. And then because everything is shifting to subscription and consumption, everything is shifting in terms of business models, post-transaction, there is a completely new world. Driving adoption to get that renewal, driving integrations to become more sticky, to make sure you can't be unplugged, to drive that retention rate. And then finally, who's out there upselling and cross-selling your customer every 30 days forever? So in the case of this new models of subscription, the original transaction is only the first 30 days with the customer. And then all the fun starts and you gotta make sure you've got the right partnerships that are out doing adoption, stickiness and upsell, cross-sell forever. And so now you've got to look at your program. You've got to look at your processes. You've got to look at your people. You've got to look at the technology underlying all that and figure out whether you've got the right mix to handle this entire ecosystem that you're hitting on all cylinders. So we know that 76% of CEOs in every industry, in every geography of every size, think that their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. There is disruption happening everywhere. You kind of think of the Netflix model or the Airbnb model or the Uber model or the Apple iTunes model. I mean, we read about it every day in magazines and things about every industry being disrupted by a technology uh, company or several. And so this idea that the answer to all of this disruption is also technology and it links into ecosystem. So I'm actually gonna jump out of technology for a second 
and talk about a forklift company who happened to add an Internet of Things device to each forklift so that every second there's a thousand data points that are sent out into the industry. Construction company, the builder, the architect, everyone is now swimming in data. The weight of whatever this forklift is, is lifting, which is basically all a forklift does, if you think about it. But it's also the temperature, it's the GPS coordinates, it's the humidity. There's a lot of stuff there to be had. And the idea of all this data is to build bigger, faster, cheaper buildings, faster. So this idea that how can technology enable this company, but how can it start to evolve to get outside of its traditional world and start to leverage it? So if you go to the website, it's not about the thickness of the steel. It's not about the size of the tires, which it used to be. It's not about the hundreds of dealerships that you can walk into to rent or buy this forklift. It's about a digital solution. Like this chart on the right looks like something you'd see from Microsoft or AWS or Google or IBM or something. But no, this is a forklift company that's now the digital solution. And if you click one more time on their website, you get an ecosystem a central digital ecosystem for everything. So they're not just serving their dealerships anymore. They're serving everybody. They're partnering up with Microsoft and Google and AWS and IBM and SAP and Oracle and all the SaaS companies. And you know they've got thousands of new relationships in this ecosystem that they're driving based on this new bloodline, which is data. And this is a completely new company in front of a completely new buyer who has a completely different sales pitch than they did a year ago. I could take you through an example in every industry of these ecosystems permeating everywhere. But this is the biggest difference, if you take anything away, is it's not about the transaction. It's not about the revenue. It's not about the profit. It's not about the customer sat, the stuff you would have measured. Those are still important. But what's more important in an ecosystem is measuring intra-firm value creation. One plus one equals three in front of the client. It's measuring network effects. Not only does that forklift, you know, partner with Microsoft and Microsoft gets access to that construction industry in the way that they never have before in Canada. Well, now this forklift gets to leverage Microsoft and their 355,000 partners and 7,500 new partners that join Microsoft every single month are now part of this forklift's broader ecosystem. And so it goes a two-way street in network effects. And then the third, maybe the most important is co-innovation. So when you have these 8,000 data points, there isn't the software, there isn't the internet of things and hardware, there isn't all the sensors and everything necessary to take advantage of it. So there are companies, and I predict 825,000 of them, that are grabbing this opportunity and building out last mile solutions in the construction industry to build bigger, faster, cheaper buildings. And once they build a few of these in Toronto, they're going to move this software around the world so that every building and all boats rise in the industry. This is the co-innovation that comes in an ecosystem. When you pair together two non-traditional style partners and start thinking about driving customer value. Let's talk about subscription and consumption. You know, when I talk about 76% of CEOs, the underlying thing is this new model of how customers will buy and how you service your customer, what the experience is. And so we've seen a lot of change. Just a couple of months ago, IBM jettisoned its service group. I was there while they built 450,000 people in services. Well, now it's in hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, you know, kind of red hat, open shift, AI, Watson company. And it's moving into the subscription and consumption as a service model for the future. It's a very different looking company going forward. You missed that one. Michael Dell announced all seven Dell technologies and $93 billion going full as a service subscription model and getting accelerated because of COVID. If you happen to miss that one, you know, Chuck Robbins at Cisco announced the same thing a couple of weeks before that, where it's getting accelerated. And they're going to be a hundred percent of a consumption subscription based business. HPE who's been on this journey for, you know, three years with GreenLake is now announced that they're going to get there by 2022, which is 10 months from now. So those four companies, by the way, if you listen back to the 90s or early 2000s, that represented like the lion's share of the client server era 
which is now in a consumption model or a subscription model by the month, every 30 days, forever. It's a big change in our industry. And I predict that you're going to see 10,000 different companies make these announcements. It's just where the world is going. I get to look at all the technology that underlies ecosystems and channels. And I break it up and I stack rank all these companies against each other. But suffice it to say, I get to look at 183 companies. I get to look at what these 10,000 vendors are asking them to build in the next 18 months. And that's how I predict the future, is what are all these roadmaps, when I look at them over and over and over again, amount to? Where do we, how will we be running channels? The 100 elements of the channel program, all of the processes, the people and the community modes, the technology underlying, all of this actually is here. And watching the future through the lens of those that are building it is a really interesting place for your own career to figure out kind of where the puck is going to use my favorite Canadian quote, being a Canadian, I can use it. So the next one now is everything changes. So when the resell or that transactional model, you know, becomes less important, you know, it becomes one of those three by trifurcated parts of the channel, you start moving the money around a little bit like peanut butter. You don't get any new money from your CFO. You don't get any new people. You don't get all this wonderful new things to go build an ecosystem. You've got to build it with what you've got. So the gross to nets in your company and the front and back end margins and how you've financially structured your channel is changing radically. As you're going to have to move incentives, you're going to have to move all of the elements earlier in the journey and later in the journey than you've ever had them before. But the fact of the matter is all of your content, your messaging, and your communication changes in an ecosystem. You know, you've got 80% of your future partners that actually don't care what your margins are because they don't sell it. They wanna know what your multiplier is. For every dollar you sell in the market, how much can go to them? And we have companies now, Salesforce, for example, is $4.65 for every dollar they sell. And a partner, 64% of that is professional services. It needs to be installed, implemented, integrated. It needs to be um, managed in a completely different way. So Google Cloud is $5.32, Microsoft somewhere between five and $9. You're gonna see every company come out with this multiplier number shortly. So the next one is the layers of the cake. Like we know in the cloud today, for example, when you go and buy Salesforce on the App Exchange, on average, you're going to buy six other things. And that's software. And then obviously there's this $4.65 total. So part of that is software, but you know, two-thirds of it is services. But you're going to consume a lot to get it to work. And so what happens is there's this connective tissue between all of these layers. When I go back to the forklift example or when I talk about anything in ecosystems, who is the company? that's getting these companies to collaborate with each other, to uh, connect with each other in new ways and to communicate you know, with each other in new ways and, and drive this co-innovation and, and value creation and network effects. All of this connective tissue becomes the predictor of winners and losers in the future. Distribution in Canada is gonna play a big role. Ingram and TechData and Cinex and DNH and others. There's going to be others that play a major role, like the big vendors who are running marketplaces. But this is up for grabs in terms of three and a half trillion dollars or 93 billion in Canada is really up for grabs for in terms of how it's all stitched together and who's going to tax all of that and, and how that's going to work. The final prediction is really around marketplaces. And I'd be remiss if I didn't end here and, and start here because they've grown more in the first three months of the pandemic than the last 10 years combined. And I have a stack of Amazon boxes at my front door. I, I think many do, you know, this afternoon. The fact of the matter is it's happening in our professional lives. It's happening in our personal lives. The fact of the matter is these hockey stick of a curve is happening somewhat in parallel to each other. And I'm focused more on the B2B side of it because I think the consumer side is fascinating. Uh, as it drains my credit card uh, each day as I make orders. But the fact of the matter is the business element could be the most impactful for the channel of any of these trends. So the first thing as we start out is that the current buyers 
I'm not talking millennials. I'm not talking Generation Z. I'm talking everybody actually thinks is pretty very is pretty convenient. When you have a future that I've talked about that is based on subscription and consumption models, you don't buy a subscription from Larry in the cable van who drives by every month. You buy it from a digital ecosystem. You buy it from a uh, e-commerce or a marketplace. And if you don't watch Netflix for a couple of months, you cancel it. You know, simple as that. The fact is, is in this consumption model, you end up buying everything in one place. Not only the you know procure and provision software in one place, but the additional hardware and now the services. So this multiplier, all of it ends up going through the marketplace. So not only does Salesforce sell their own dollar, they tax the next dollar, which is software, the other six layers at 15%. But now they're going to tax the next $3.65 as well at 15% sometime in the future. So everyone that owns these marketplaces has this financial platform control. And we know, for example, that Wall Street really likes this. You know, the trillion dollar companies today, the five of them are all platform companies that own eyeballs. There's no mistake why Apple gets to charge magazines and newspapers 40% to get on Apple News. They own it and they can charge that level of taxation. Well, in the software world, the same thing's going to happen. Software eats the world, and those who own the platforms get to own the taxation. So if you can sell your own dollar, tax the next $5, even at 15%, you've just doubled your revenue overnight. This is why Wall Street wants marketplaces. Customers seem to want marketplaces. And in a future that's subscription, consumption, embedded, and white-labeled, which is all the future tech, AI, automation, blockchain, quantum computing, everything is not a product or a skew. It's embedded. In a future like that, it's all about digital connective tissue and everything is going to start and end with the marketplace. So this isn't going to happen tomorrow. We're not going to undo procurement divisions. We're not going to undo the federal government's you know, backwards way of acquiring technology anytime soon. But we're starting to predict, like we thought by 2023, we'd hit 17% of the tech market in Canada. We think now that it might happen later this year. That's how fast it's accelerating. This is why it's not a back burner issue anymore. It's come to the front burner because anything in double digits in your own route to market in terms of the way your customers want to buy becomes a front burner issue for everybody in the channel because most marketplace activity is indirect sales. You may run your own e-commerce and marketplace, but 80% or more of the opportunity is going to be through other marketplaces. And this is the way the world's shaping up now. We know that there's hyper marketplaces, the Amazons and the Alibabas. One level below that, there is the Amazon for business and Alibaba for business that collects a lot of the $13 trillion of you know, paper and paper clips and forklifts and other things that go into B2B. The fact of the matter, though, is there is the next layer, which goes into the tech industry. I'm predicting there's 20 winners here. And they we already know who they are. So we know that Microsoft and we know AWS and Google, we know Salesforce and ServiceNow and Workday and Marketo and NetSuite, Adobe. We know that Oracle and SAP and IBM, I mean, we kind of know who the 20 winners are already. There's one or two that are questionable, but the fact of the matter is we know who the winners are. And if the money goes this direction, you're going to have to have a dual market play strategy, internal marketplace, if that's where you're positioned in the marketplace, as uh, sorry, in the market as a vendor, but the external one, you may not be that purple layer on the cake, the first layer where the customer starts. You might be add-on security. You might be add-on continuity. You might be add-on AI or automation. You might be add-on somewhere else in the equation. And it's tough to tell big companies this. You know, when I worked at IBM, we were always the million dollar start of the conversation where partners always came in after the fact. Well, now IBM could be the $10,000 final layer of the cake in Watson AI, where someone else like Salesforce is the purple layer that's earning the million dollars in the deal. And you would have noticed last week that IBM announced a billion dollars of investment into the ecosystem, not to grow their business, but for survival. They understand now that they've led patents for 28 straight years, that the future that they've been inventing isn't a product and they don't have the sales and marketing teams today that can sell in an embedded, subscribed, consumed, 
metered, white labeled the world. And they're investing a lot of money to get there quickly. And you're going to start to see this with every company as they transform is to succeed. Final piece of this niche marketplace is really out to those 35 million opportunities. If you want to go set up a mid-sized clinic um, marketplace in northern Saskatchewan, you know, go at it. All these companies here can help you. And they can fill up your catalog. They can build out. And by Monday morning, you have that you know, compliant marketplace out there that's been vetted and validated and qualified for those customers. But it's not going to succeed, and we know it. But the fact is, a Canadian-wide mid-sized clinic marketplace that adheres to Canadian standards as well as provincial standards may. So instead of going into one of these huge marketplaces like Amazon and having a trillion things there, now they know that it's compliant and regulatory and legislative and governed, and they kind of get into an environment that might work. So there are today thousands of niche marketplaces, and in the future, there'll probably be tens of thousands up against that 35 million number of the net opportunity of successful self-fulfilling marketplaces that is an opportunity for those players in the Canadian market to go think about each of those five vectors and where marketplaces might make sense. So I wanna thank you for taking the time and walking through many of these uh, you know, large trends and you know, thinking through in a very customized way what this means to you, what this means into your future job role and you know, any, anything in your career, but think about through the lens of your company. And you know, whether you work at a forklift company, whether you work at a big company like you know, Microsoft that I mentioned, whether you work for a small VAR in Saskatoon who has some mid-sized clinics in your current customer base, it doesn't matter where you are in the market, there are pieces of this that apply to you. All of them could be risks if you, if you look at it that way, but all of them are massive opportunities. You know, if the future your customer buys in a marketplace and you lose the 30% of the deal that you used to you know, get on resale, but you can start competing for a dollar or $2 or $3 for every dollar that that vendor sold by offering up the right services, the right software, no code, low code, start building your own last mile, become a vendor yourself, getting on top of these ecosystem opportunities of co-innovation and start, you know, in Northern Saskatchewan, build out products that could be work, you know, used globally. These are all opportunities that are massive in scale. And again, it can't be measured that the numbers are so big, but if you get it right into your company, into your own role and into your own customers, you know, there is a hundred percent plus triple digit growth in your own future. So thank you so much for, for listening. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. You can pretty, pretty well find me anywhere if you wanna grab some of this research or ask me about a, a number that I shared. Happy to, uh, to engage there. And I look forward to the rest of this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shay. It was a pleasure to have you on board. And thank you for sharing the channel trends, the ecosystem, and especially the marketplace.